Imagine the dawn of the new year, 1942. The German U-boat fleet swelling in numbers now boasts 331 operational vessels. This formidable armada lurking beneath the waves posed a serious threat to the Allied forces. Each submarine, a silent predator, was a testament to Germany's industrial might and strategic planning. Their torpedoes brought terror to shipping lanes, disrupting supply chains and instilling fear. While the U-boats prowled the seas, another crisis unfolded in the icy Russian city of Leningrad. In the bitter cold of the Russian winter, an exodus was taking place. As the relentless grip of World War II tightened, an impressive 800,000 citizens of Leningrad found themselves embarking on a perilous journey. They sought escape through a frozen passage, a frigid lifeline sprawled above the icy expanse of Lake Lagoda. The conditions they faced were nothing short of brutal. Imagine the biting cold, the hunger gnawing at their bellies, the fear gnashing at their hearts. Yet in this vast migration there lied a strategic significance. The evacuation served a dual purpose not only to preserve the lives of the Leningrad denizens, but also to free the city for defense against the encroaching German forces. Each step taken, each breath drawn in the numbing cold, was a testament to their resilience. As citizens braved the icy passage, the Soviets made a significant move on the Crimean front. January saw the birth of a new front in the fight against the Axis powers. As the chill of winter swept across the landscape, the Soviet Union readied its forces for a fresh assault. This was the conception of the Crimea Front, an ambitious and strategic plan to counter the Axis advance. At the helm was Major General D.T. Kozlov, a man known for his tactical acumen and unwavering resolve. Under his command, three Soviet armies were mobilized, their movements calculated and precise. Each maneuver, each decision, was part of a larger, intricate web of warfare. As these armies navigated the complexities of the battlefield, a silent predator was wreaking havoc off the east coast of the United States. Unseen and unheard, the U-boats claimed 216 vessels off the east coast. These silent predators of the deep German U-boats prowled the waters, sinking ships with a chilling efficiency. This onslaught sent shockwaves through the naval community, as the might of the German fleet was unveiled in its full, devastating capacity. The strategic implications were profound, disrupting supply lines and sowing fear in the hearts of seafarers. As the silent predators struck, the Japanese began their offensive on the Bataan Peninsula. On January 9th, the dug-in American forces in Bataan braced for an attack. As the dawn of the new year broke, the ominous shadow of war loomed over the Bataan Peninsula. The Japanese, relentless in their pursuit, began their offensive against the American forces who were dug in and determined to stand their ground. The Japanese strategy was ruthless and meticulously planned. They orchestrated a pincer movement, launching attacks from both the north and the south in an attempt to encircle and crush the American defenses. The American forces, under the commendable leadership of General Douglas MacArthur, fought valiantly, holding their lines against the overwhelming Japanese onslaught. Yet, despite their bravery and tenacity, the American forces were gradually pushed back. Their resources stretched thin and their numbers dwindling. The outcome was inevitable. The Bataan Peninsula fell to the Japanese, marking a significant victory for the Axis powers in the Pacific theater. The Battle of Bataan was just the beginning. The wheels of war were turning, and they would not stop. In the heart of Malaya, the capital city of Kuala Lumpur fell. January 11, 1942, a day etched in history. The formidable Japanese 5th Division like a storm swept through the city leaving nothing untouched. An invasion that marked a new chapter in the theater of war. Then the winds of war blew eastwards to the Dutch East Indies. The Japanese unyielding launched three amphibious forces their might echoing through the vast archipelago. Their relentless advance, a testament to a strategy executed with ruthless precision. But the Japanese ambition was far from quenched. Just four days later, on January 15th, their gaze turned to Burma. The assault began at Victoria Point, the southernmost part of the country. The Japanese forces, like a tide, surged forward, undeterred by resistance. These invasions, these falls and subsequent occupations were not mere territorial gains. They were strategic chess moves in a global game of power and dominance. The Japanese had not only expanded their empire but also cut off crucial supply routes, leaving the Allies in a precarious position. 
As the dust settled on these battlefields, the American lines in Bataan finally broke. On January 23rd, the once unyielding American defensive lines finally broke. This marked a pivotal moment in the Pacific theater. The American forces dug in on the Bataan Peninsula, had held out against the Japanese offensive for weeks. The fall of their defensive lines signaled a significant victory for the Japanese and a devastating blow for the Americans. Meanwhile, on the other side of the globe, the Soviet forces were beginning to feel the strain of continuous warfare. After weeks of relentless fighting and pushing against the German front, the Soviet movement began to lose steam. The limitations of man and machine were becoming apparent. The once formidable Soviet forces were slowing down, their progress stalling. And so, as January 1942 came to a close, the world held its breath, waiting to see what the next month of war would bring. Picture this, the morning of February 2, 1942. Adolf Hitler in a rare move approves of a retreat for his forces at Rostov. The air in the room was thick with tension as the Fuhrer made the call. An admission of defeat was not something he took lightly. But Rostov was no ordinary city. It was a strategic gem, a key to the vast resources of the Caucasus, and a gateway to the heart of Russia. The decision to retreat was not made lightly. Hitler and his generals, including the formidable General Manstein, had lengthy discussions, weighing the pros and cons. The situation on the ground was dire. The Wehrmacht was stretched thin, and the Russian winter was taking its toll. The choice was clear, yet painful. Preserve the strength of their forces, or risk total annihilation. And so, on February 5th, General Manstein's forces officially abandoned Rostov, leaving it open for the taking. The city, once bustling with German soldiers, now lay eerily silent, a ghost town waiting for its fate to unfold. Just a day later, on February 6th, a determined General Manstein meets with Hitler. He proposes a new German counterattack against the Russians. Manstein, a seasoned tactician, believed that a swift and decisive blow could turn the tide of the war. His plan was audacious, focusing on using the mobility and power of the German panzer divisions to punch through the Russian defenses. Manstein argued that the Russians, fresh from their victories, would be off balance, not expecting a quick German counterattack. The strategy was risky, but Manstein was convinced that it was Germany's best shot at regaining the initiative on the Eastern Front. Hitler, initially skeptical, was swayed by Manstein's confidence and strategic insight. He gave his approval, setting the stage for one of the most significant counterattacks of the war. The German High Command began preparations for the new offensive, rallying their forces for the impending conflict. With a new plan in place, the Germans braced themselves for the battles to come. February 8th marks a significant date as the Soviet army retakes the Russian city of Kursk. The battle for Kursk was a crucial turning point in the Eastern Front of World War II. The city, a vital rail hub and communication center, was hotly contested terrain. Its recapture signaled a shift in momentum to the Soviets, a morale boost they sorely needed. Meanwhile, the German army was undergoing significant changes. On February 12th, Army Group Don was renamed Army Group South, and Army Group B was renamed Army Group Center. These were not mere cosmetic changes, but strategic maneuvers reflecting a shift in German military focus. The renaming was a signal, a sign of adaptation to the evolving battlefield conditions, and a testament to their flexibility in the face of adversity. While the Soviets celebrated their victory, the Germans were restructuring, preparing for the next phase of the war. Mid-February brought a flurry of activity. The Japanese had captured Borneo, Celebes, and Sarawak. Back in Russia, street fighting erupted in the city of Kharkov. The Japanese forces were on the move in Southeast Asia, claiming vital territories. Borneo, rich in oil reserves, Celebes, a strategic location, and Sarawak, with its wealth of natural resources, were all now under Japanese control. This not only bolstered the Japanese war effort, but also strained the Allied resources. Meanwhile, thousands of miles away, the snow-covered streets of Kharkov had become a battlefield. The German ISS Panzer Corps engaged in fierce combat with the Russian 3rd Tank Army and 40th Army forces. It was a brutal house-to-house, -house, street to street fight. The city was under a constant state of chaos and uncertainty as control shifted hands between the two warring sides. By February 18th, the German forces were officially driven out of Kharkov, but the war was far from over. February 20th, a date etched in history. The Germans unleashed their counterattack employing the 4th and 1st Panzer Armies and the 2nd SS Panzer Corps. The days that followed, 
would be marked by intense fighting and tactical maneuvering. The Germans, determined to regain their lost ground, pushed forward with relentless force. Success was not immediate, but their determination paid off. By the end of the month they had recaptured significant territory. They pushed elements of the Russian army back, reaching as far as the River Donets. But the victory was not without its complications. General Vatutin's forces were surrounded, a strategic move that would have significant implications for the battles to come. As the month of February 1942 closed, the war had taken many twists and turns. The world watched and waited, wondering what would unfold next. Picture this, March 1st, 1942, Hitler and his commanders are meticulously plotting Operation Blue. This is not just another military maneuver. It's a meticulously planned invasion of the oil-rich, Russian-held Caucasus. But why the Caucasus, you might wonder? It's simple. The region is brimming with oil, the lifeblood of any war machine. Hitler, acutely aware of this, sees an opportunity to fuel his war effort and simultaneously cripple his enemy. The potential implications of a successful invasion are enormous. It could tip the balance of the war in favor of the Axis powers, strengthening their grip on Europe and beyond. The stakes are high, the tension palpable. Hitler and his commanders pore over maps, calculating, strategizing, plotting. As their plans take shape, an ominous sense of what's to come fills the air. The world waits with bated breath, unknowing of the storm that is about to unfold in the Caucasus. Meanwhile, on the Eastern Front, the Soviet offensive near Novgorod grinds to a halt. A chilling wind swept across the battlefield, as the German ground and air elements swooped in, bringing with them a formidable force that the Soviets could not counter. This was not just a battle. It was a relentless onslaught that would see the entire Soviet Second Shock Army perish near Novgorod. The Germans, with their powerful panzer tanks and Luftwaffe air support, turned the tide of the battle. The Soviet forces, once a formidable threat, found themselves outmaneuvered and outnumbered. The Soviets fought bravely, but the German forces were relentless. The Soviet Second Shock Army, once a symbol of Soviet strength, was lost to the icy grip of the Russian winter and the unyielding German onslaught. This was a crushing defeat for the Soviets, a setback that echoed across the Eastern Front. A devastating blow for the Soviets, their forces decimated, their hope dwindling. This was the Soviet setback. On the same day, the British Royal Air Force welcomes a new addition to their fleet, the Avro Lancaster Heavy Bomber. This isn't just any aircraft. Unveiled amidst the turmoil of World War II, the Avro Lancaster is a marvel of engineering. With a wingspan of 102 feet and powered by four Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, it's capable of carrying an impressive load of up to 14,000 pounds of bombs. This heavy bomber, with its speed and agility, is set to change the dynamics of air warfare. Its superior range allows it to penetrate deep into enemy territory, delivering devastating payloads with precision. The Lancaster's unique design also provides a defensive edge, equipped with multiple machine gun turrets to fend off enemy fighters. This new weapon, a beacon of hope in the dark days of war, is poised to make a significant impact. March 7th sees German General Hoth and his 4th Panzer Army launching an offensive against the Voronezh Front near Kharkov. In the early days of March 1942, the snow-covered plains of Kharkov bore witness to the rumble of German tanks as they geared up for an assault. The city, a strategic stronghold, was the prize both sides sought in this deadly game of chess. The 4th Panzer Army, led by the tenacious General Hoth, assembled with a single objective, to reclaim Kharkov from the Soviets. The air was thick with anticipation. The silence before the storm was only punctuated by the idling engines of the German panzers. By March 12th, the silence was replaced with the cacophony of war. German forces entered Kharkov and the city streets were transformed into a battlefield. The echo of gunfire, the clamor of tanks and the terrified screams of civilians were the grim symphony that played out in this urban theater of war. The battle was brutal and unforgiving. Buildings crumbled under the relentless German offensive, streets were painted red, and the city's spirit was tested to its limits. But Kharkov did not surrender easily. Soviet soldiers fought with a ferocity that was as chilling as the Russian winter, their determination fueled by the love for their motherland. As the month draws to a close, the British Royal Air Force makes a bold move. The RAF, in a calculated act of defiance, targets the German city of Lübeck. The city, known for its rich history and beautiful architecture, 
becomes the center of a devastating air raid. The RAF's mission is not just about destruction, it's a demonstration of their capabilities, a show of force. They deploy 234 bombers, each loaded with incendiary devices, designed to set the city ablaze. The night sky is lit up as the bombs find their targets, turning buildings, streets and lives into ashes. This mission also marks a significant advancement in technology. For the first time, the RAF uses the G electronic navigation system. This revolutionary tool allows for more precise targeting, increasing the effectiveness of the bombing. It's a game changer, a tool that promises to tilt the balance of the war. But, like every war mission, this one too comes with a price. Twelve of the RAF's aircraft don't return. Twelve crews, their lives cut short in the line of duty. Each loss is a blow, a reminder of the human cost of war. Yet, these brave men and women knew the risks and chose to face them, driven by a sense of duty and the hope of a better future. The bombing of Lübeck is a significant event, a clear message to the Axis powers. The Allies are fighting back, they are capable and willing to take the fight to the enemy's doorstep. It's a grim reminder to all that war has no winners, only survivors. Imagine a quiet day on the Bay of Bengal, April 1, 1942, when suddenly a massive Japanese aircraft carrier, the Ryujo, appears on the horizon. This move was no ordinary deployment, it marked a significant shift in the power dynamics during World War II. The Ryujo, a ship with a history of pushing boundaries, was venturing into the Indian Ocean, a territory where the Japanese had not dared to venture before. This was a bold statement by Japan, a declaration of their intentions to extend their sphere of influence beyond the Pacific. The Ryujo's entry into the Bay of Bengal was not just a geographical transition, it was a strategic maneuver signaling Japan's readiness to challenge the Allied forces on a new front. The ripple effects of this move were felt far and wide, setting off a chain of events that would redefine the course of the war. This was only the beginning of a series of events that would shape the course of the war. Meanwhile in Europe, away from the tranquil waters of the Bay of Bengal, German forces were gathering strength. A two-month period saw a surge of activity as supplies poured in to fortify the troops. A key component of this resupply mission was the arrival of 33 massive artillery pieces. These were no ordinary weapons. They were designed with a specific purpose in mind, to annihilate the Soviet defensive works at the fort in Sevastopol. Each piece of artillery was a testament to German engineering, huge, ominous and meticulously crafted for destruction. Their arrival marked a significant boost in the offensive capabilities of the German forces, a necessary enhancement for the challenging task that lay ahead. This was all in preparation for Operation Bustard, a meticulously planned major offensive. The goal was clear and non-negotiable, to remove the Soviet presence from the Kerch Peninsula. The stage was set for a battle that would etch its name in the annals of history. Back in the Indian Ocean, no fewer than five Japanese Navy aircraft carriers reached the waters by April 3rd. The sea was humming with the formidable force of the Imperial Japanese Navy, and the tension was palpable. The British Royal Navy, operating in the same waters, was far from oblivious to the looming threat. Admiral Sir James Somerville, a man of action, was quick to respond. He understood the gravity of the situation, and made a decision that would alter the course of the war in the Indian Ocean. He detached a force, a group of brave men and mighty vessels with a single mission, intercept the arriving Japanese fleet. It was a calculated risk, a gamble against the odds. The stakes were high and the price of failure unthinkable. But in the face of adversity, the spirit of the British Royal Navy stood strong. The Indian Ocean was about to become a battleground. April 6, 1942, a day that would go down in history as the day the Imperial Japanese Navy launched a surprise attack on the British forces at Colombo Harbor, Ceylon. The sun was barely up, the harbor was still, and the British forces were starting their day, completely unaware of the storm that was about to hit them. Out of nowhere, the skies filled with the ominous hum of aircraft engines. The Japanese had arrived and they were not there for a friendly visit. The attack was swift and brutal. The Japanese, in a show of force and precision, unleashed a barrage of fire and fury from approximately 120 aircraft. The British, caught off guard, could only scramble to respond. The air was thick with smoke, the noise deafening, and the sight of the once peaceful harbor turned into a battlefield was nothing short of terrifying. Among the British fleet in the harbor were the HMS Cornwall and HMS Dorsetshire, two of the Royal Navy's cruisers. 
They were formidable vessels, but not even they could withstand the onslaught. Within hours, both were sent to the bottom of the harbor, their decks ablaze and their crews fighting desperately to survive. But the destruction didn't stop there. The HMS Tenedos, a destroyer of the Royal Navy, also fell victim to the Japanese airstrike. The Tenedos, known for its speed and agility, could not evade the relentless bombardment. It too was sunk, adding to the tally of British naval losses that day. The attack on Colombo Harbor was a grim reminder of the power and reach of the Japanese forces. The British had been dealt a heavy blow, their naval power in the region significantly weakened. But this was not a decisive victory for the Japanese, nor was it the end for the British. It was a single battle in a much larger war. The British forces were caught off guard, but the war was far from over. The fight for control of the Indian Ocean, and indeed the outcome of the Second World War, was still very much in the balance. But for now the day belonged to the Japanese. Their surprise attack had indeed been a surprise and a devastating one at that. Fast forward to April 9th, the day American forces fighting on the Bataan Peninsula finally surrendered to the Japanese. In a crushing blow to the morale of the Allies, these brave men and women who had fought valiantly were left with no choice but to lay down their arms. It was a day of somber realization, as the stark reality of the relentless Japanese onslaught became all too real. The surrender wasn't just a loss of troops, but also a strategic setback. The Bataan Peninsula was a crucial defense point, and its fall opened the way for the Japanese to push further into the region. The American forces, exhausted, undersupplied, and overwhelmed, could no longer hold the line. But the events of April 9th were not confined to the Bataan Peninsula. Over in the Indian Ocean, the Japanese were making their presence felt as well. An 85-strong Japanese Navy aircraft contingent launched a ruthless attack on airfields and targets of opportunity at Trincomalee, Ceylon. The day was marked by a series of tragic losses. Among the casualties was the HMS Hermes, a stalwart of the Royal Navy. The Hermes was one of four Royal Navy ships that were sunk by Japanese aircraft that day. This attack was not just a physical assault, but also an attack on the spirit of the Allied forces. The sinking of the Hermes, a symbol of British naval might, was a heavy blow. It served as a harsh reminder of the formidable power of the Japanese Navy and the immense challenges that lay ahead for the Allies in the Pacific. Despite these setbacks, the Allies were not beaten. Each loss, each surrender, each sunken ship served to steal their resolve. It was a grim day, but it was also a day that sowed the seeds of a comeback a day that would fuel the determination of the Allies to turn the tide of the war. It was a devastating blow to the Allied forces in the Pacific. But it was also a spark, a spark that would ignite the flame of resistance, a spark that would eventually lead to victory. Picture this, it's May 3, 1942. The Imperial Japanese Army lands at Tulagi in the Solomon Islands group. Now why Tulagi, you might wonder? Well, Tulagi held strategic importance for the Japanese, Seizing control of this island ensured a solid base of operations for their logistics in the region, a foothold in the Pacific. Meanwhile, the Imperial Japanese Navy carrier force was setting sail, prowling around the Solomons, hunting for American carrier battle groups. Now, here's where things get interesting. American intelligence, always on their toes, intercepts various Japanese communications. They start piecing together the puzzle, and the picture it forms isn't pretty. It reveals a chilling intention an invasion of Port Moresby, New Guinea. The stakes were high, the players ready, and the game board was set. As the sun set, the tension was palpable. The chess pieces were moving, and a significant battle was on the horizon. The next morning, the USS Yorktown launched strike aircraft south of Guadalcanal. It was 6.30 a.m., a time when most of the world was just waking up. But these brave American Navy pilots were already in the air, eyes keenly scanning the horizon. They spotted their targets, the Japanese land emplacements and sea vessels in the area. The aircraft swooped down, their engines roaring as they unleashed their payload. The Japanese, caught off guard, scrambled to respond. Meanwhile, a Japanese invasion force was on the move. Leaving Rabul, New Britain, they set their sights on Port Moresby, New Guinea, a strategic point that could tip the balance of power in the region. But the American forces were not about to let that happen without a fight. As the day ended, the stakes were high. The chessboard was set for a major confrontation. The stage was set, the players were in position, and the next move would be a crucial one. May 5th, 
a new day, a new battlefield, the Japanese enacted an offensive to take Corregidor Island. This wasn't just any island. Corregidor, a small rocky tadpole-shaped island at the entrance of Manila Bay, held strategic importance. It was a gatekeeper, a sentinel, and a guardian of Manila Bay, the very heart of the American defensive line in the Philippines. The battle was intense, a clash of titans under the tropical sun. The Japanese forces, relentless and determined, fought tooth and nail. Despite the fierce resistance from the American and Filipino defenders, the island was slowly but surely losing ground. The enemy, like an unstoppable wave, washed over the island's defenses. And then on May 6 it happened. Corregidor Island fell to the Japanese, the gatekeeper had been defeated, the sentinel silenced. The invaders now had control over Manila Bay, the heart of the Philippines. With the fall of Corregidor Island, the Japanese had gained a significant advantage. May 7th, a day that would go down in history. The Battle of the Coral Sea begins. The stage was set for a clash of titans, a dance of destruction across the vast expanse of the Pacific. The Allied Task Force 44, led by the Royal Navy's Rear Admiral Kreis, had one mission, to intercept the Japanese invasion force. The tension hung heavy, as the task force moved with stealth and precision, cutting through the waves towards their target. But war is a game of chance and strategy, and sometimes it's the unexpected that turns the tide. The Japanese reconnaissance aircraft scouring the skies, spotted the task force. It was a premature discovery that upended the plans of the Allies. The Japanese Navy warplanes wasted no time. They swooped down from the clouds, launching a fierce counter-assault on the task force. The waves churned and the sky roared as the USS Neosho and USS Sims met their untimely end, claimed by the unforgiving sea. Yet, amidst the chaos and the carnage, the Allies spotted the Japanese covering group, the guardians of the invasion force. It was a window of opportunity, a chance to strike back. The USS Lexington and the USS Yorktown, two giants of the sea, launched their attack planes. The sky became a battlefield filled with the roar of engines and the streaks of gunfire. In the ensuing dogfight, the Japanese aircraft carrier Shoho was sent to a watery grave. It was a blow to the Japanese, a sign that the Allies were far from defeated. With the sinking of the Shoho, the Japanese were forced to reassess their strategy. The invasion of Port Moresby was called off. As the dust settled, the Battle of the Coral Sea had reached its conclusion. The chessboard had been upended, and the course of the war had been forever changed. May 8, 1942, a day that will forever be etched in the annals of history. As the sun rose, Operation Blue was set into motion. With the break of dawn, German General Manstein, a figure of formidable strategy and unyielding determination, led his 11th Army onto the Kerch Peninsula. Their eyes were set on the city of Sevastopol, a strategic stronghold that would play a significant role in the unfolding events of World War II. Meanwhile, thousands of miles away, the Japanese invasion force beat a strategic retreat back to New Britain. As the evening fell, the Japanese High Command launched a squadron of 27 aircraft under the cover of darkness. Their mission was a daring one, to locate the Allied task force in the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean. The night was fraught with tension, the darkness both a cloak and a barrier, but the mission proved unsuccessful. Of the 27, only six aircraft returned safely home, leaving a chilling silence in their wake. As the first rays of sunlight pierced the morning haze, the Japanese and American carrier groups spotted each other in the vast expanse of the Pacific. It was a moment of stalemate, a pause in the escalating symphony of war. But this lull was short-lived. At exactly 9.25 a.m., warplanes from both sides took to the skies, their engines roaring in defiance and determination. The sky was soon filled with the dance of warplanes, a ballet of smoke and fire, of courage and fear. The hours ticked by, each moment heavy with anticipation. And then, at 11.40 a.m., the U.S. Navy warplanes made their mark. The Japanese aircraft carrier Shokaku was hit, the damage severe. It was a moment of triumph for the Allies, a beacon of hope amidst the chaos of war. But as the day would unfold, they would soon realize that the scales of war can tip in the blink of an eye. With the rising tension and the stakes high, the USS Lexington faced a critical blow. It was a day like any other in the throes of World War II, when at 2.47 in the afternoon, the American carrier was struck by a Japanese torpedo. The impact was catastrophic, causing a major explosion in her generator room that echoed through the vastness of the Pacific waters. The once formidable vessel, 
affectionately known as Lady Lex, was in grave peril. Yet even in the face of adversity the spirit of her crew remained unbroken. Amidst the smoke and chaos the sailors fought valiantly against the inevitable. Their mission shifted from battle to survival, and by six in the evening, nearly all of the Lexington sailors had been rescued, a testament to the resilience and brotherhood of those who serve at sea. But the USS Lexington, severely wounded and crippled by the strike, could not be saved. At 6.10 in the evening, the decision was made to scuttle the ship. With a heavy heart, the order was given, and the USS Lexington was sunk, her silhouette disappearing beneath the Pacific waves. As the sun set, the USS Lexington was lost to the depths, a stark reminder of the day's events. The sinking of this great vessel marked a crucial point in the war, a poignant symbol of sacrifice and resilience in the face of adversity. On May 9th, the Battle of Coral Sea took a decisive turn. The Japanese Vice Admiral, Takagi, found himself in a precarious situation. The odds were stacked against him, yet he was ordered to send his warplanes aloft. His mission was clear locate and decimate the American fleet. As the Japanese aircraft sliced through the sky, the tension was palpable. But as fate would have it, the search proved futile. The American fleet remained elusive, hidden in the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean. Hours passed, and with each passing moment, hope dwindled. The skies began to darken, mirroring the sinking spirits of the Japanese airmen. With heavy hearts, they called off the search, effectively marking the end of the Battle of Coral Sea. The day ended, and with it, the Battle of Coral Sea. This battle would be remembered not for its conclusion, but for its significance, a testament to the unpredictable nature of warfare. May 12th brought about a significant shift in power. The Soviet Union, like a sleeping bear, finally stirred. Their ground forces launched a preemptive offensive, striking hard against the German-held Kharkov. This was an attempt to reclaim their land, their pride, and their power, a resounding statement that they would not be easily defeated. While the Soviets were making their move, the Germans were not idle. They enacted Operation Friedericus, a strategic chess move of their own, aiming to take Izum. Both sides were engaged in a fierce tug of war, each seeking to gain ground to tip the balance of power in their favor. This was a day when the stakes couldn't be higher. Each move, each decision, had the potential to alter the course of the war dramatically, with the day's end, the chessboard of war had seen some significant moves. May 15th, a day of victories and defeats. One could sense the tides of war shifting. Far to the east, the proud nation of Burma fell under the looming shadow of the Japanese Empire. A once sovereign land, now another jewel in the imperial crown, Burma's fall was a stark reminder of the ever-expanding reach of the Japanese forces. Meanwhile, the echoes of war reverberated across the rugged landscapes of the Kerch Peninsula. Manstein, the German general known for his tactical genius, had led his offensive successfully, taking the peninsula from the Soviets. The brilliance of his strategy had not only secured this strategic location, but it also effectively isolated the city of Sevastopol from the rest of the Soviet Union. This was a significant blow to the Soviets cutting off a vital supply route and leaving the city vulnerable to the impending German assault. But as the dust settled on the battlefield, there was no time for rest. Manstein, ever the strategist, was already planning his next major offensive. This would become known as Operation Sturgeon, a plan that would further test the resilience and will of the Soviet forces. As the day closed, the fate of nations had been altered in the theater of war. Each victory and defeat, each advance and retreat, was etching a new map of the world, a map that would continue to be shaped by the relentless march of World War II. Picture this. May 20th, 1942, the 2nd Canadian Infantry Division starting their training for a mission named Operation Rudder on the Isle of Wight. In the throes of World War II, the world is a chessboard of strategies and maneuvers. Amidst this, the 2nd Canadian Infantry Division is given a task, a training exercise with a cryptic name, Operation Rudder, this isn't your run-of-the-mill training. The Isle of Wight, a speck of land in the English Channel, is the chosen ground for this unexpected preparation. The soldiers hardened by the war are puzzled. Operation Rudder? What could it possibly be? An air of mystery surrounds this operation. Why the Isle of Wight? What's so special about this place? 
Questions whirl around like a persistent gale, but answers are as elusive as a whisper in the wind. The Canadians train, their hearts filled with determination, their minds racing with questions. As the Canadians train across the sea, a large naval force begins to stir. Five days later on May 25th, a large Imperial Japanese naval force sails from Japan towards Midway Island. The force is a formidable one made up of four distinct task forces, each with its own critical mission. The first is tasked with an audacious invasion of the Aleutian Islands, off the coast of Alaska. The remaining three forces are set to play a high-stakes game of chess on the seas, with Midway Island as the coveted prize. They are also tasked with challenging the responding United States naval fleet, a task not for the faint-hearted. One of these three groups boasts the inclusion of the required four aircraft carriers, vessels that would serve as floating fortresses in the upcoming battles. Each task force, like the cogs of a well-oiled machine, was primed for the monumental tasks ahead. While the Japanese set sail on the African front, an assault is brewing. The very next day, Group Crewell, made up of Italian X and Kevin Corps, launches an assault on the northern portion of the Gazala Line. A daring strategy, this assault serves as a diversion, designed to draw the attention of the Allied forces away from the real attack brewing in the south. As the Italian Corps push against the northern fortifications, a formidable offensive takes shape in the south. Under the cover of darkness, at exactly 7 in the evening, the German 90th Infantry Division, the 15th and 21st Panzer Divisions, and the Italian XX Corps, all under the keen leadership of Rommel, launch their offensive. The southern portion of the Gazala Line, a daunting 50 miles of British defenses, is now under siege, but the Allies are not without their heroes. As the German forces make progress, the 1st Free French Brigade at Birhakheim puts up a gallant resistance. On May 27th, German forces south of Birhakheim make progress and begin to move northwards. They march with a relentless determination, but the 1st Free French Brigade at Birhakheim is not to be easily swayed. They stand their ground, holding off the German advance with a spirit as unyielding as iron. Meanwhile, the German panzer forces, in their relentless pursuit of Sidra Ridge, find their numbers dwindling. Each day their casualties mount, a grim testament to the fierce resolve of those who stand against them. In the midst of this ground conflict, a different kind of battle takes shape in the skies. On the 30th of May, the RAF Bombers Command launches an audacious attack on Cologne. Over a thousand aircraft darken the sky, their payloads promising destruction. The city below becomes a canvas of explosions and fire, a grim spectacle of war's might. While the skies over Cologne light up with the fire of a thousand bombers, Rommel is forced to change tactics. As the Allied defense along the Gazala line holds, Rommel is forced to change tactics on May 31st. The relentless resistance from the Allies was unexpected, and it led to a significant shift in the Axis strategy. Rommel, known for his cunning on the battlefield, turned his attention to the British 150th Brigade near Sidi Mufta. It was a tactical decision, one meant to exploit what he perceived to be a weak point in the Allied defenses. His orders were clear and decisive. Defensive preparations were to begin across a 10-mile stretch, a move that signaled a shift from aggressive advancement to a more cautious approach. It was a chess game and Rommel was moving its pieces, adjusting his strategy in response to the Allies' tenacious defense. As May comes to an end, the world watches on, wondering what will happen next in this global conflict. Picture this. It's June 1, 1942. German tanks are falling, one by one, in Rommel's offensive. The brilliance of Rommel, the Desert Fox, was starting to dim as he faced a series of strategic miscalculations and logistical challenges. The desert terrain, harsh and unforgiving, claimed nearly 30% of the German tanks, a staggering blow to the offensive. The first three days of June saw a German pocket develop near Sidi Mufta, a strategic location in North Africa. This was a result of desperate maneuvers to consolidate their dwindling forces and defend against the relentless Allied counterattacks. The pocket, isolated and vulnerable, was a testament to the precarious position the Germans found themselves in. As the sun set on the 3rd of June, the German pocket near Sidi Mufta had taken shape. But the sands of North Africa were shifting and Rommel's offensive was teetering on the brink of collapse. The calendar flips to the month of June, a month that would prove to be a nightmare for Allied shipping. 
the vast expanse of the Atlantic Ocean became a graveyard for the Allies in those 30 days, a testament to the relentless onslaught of the German U-boats. The sunken vessels were more than steel, they represented the lifeblood of the war effort. 834,000 tons of goods, lost to the depths. Every day of June echoed with the sound of sinking ships. Every night was lit by the flames of burning cargo. The ocean's surface was marred by oil slicks and debris, the remnants of convoys that had set out with hope, but found only despair. The seafarers braved the perilous waters, their courage undiminished, but the losses were staggering. As June drew to a close, the devastation was clear. The single worst month of Allied shipping losses had passed. A grim toll, a haunting memory, a nightmare etched into the annals of history. June 2nd, the morning quiet is shattered by the booming of 600 German artillery guns opening fire on Sevastopol. It was a day that began with a deafening roar, and the city of Sevastopol was at the epicenter. A relentless rain of shells fell from the sky, turning buildings to rubble, streets into trenches, and a bustling city into a battlefield. Sevastopol wasn't just any city, it was a strategic jewel. Nestled on the Black Sea's shores, it was a naval base of immense importance, a gateway to the Mediterranean and a barrier against German advancement. The Germans knew this too well, hence the ferocious attack. As the day wore on, the barrage didn't let up. The city's defenders fought valiantly, their resolve hardened by the thunderous symphony of war that surrounded them. The day ended, but the struggle for Sevastopol was far from over. The sound of artillery faded, but the echo of that day's events would linger long in the hearts of those in Sevastopol. June 3rd, the Northern Task Force sets its sights on the Aleutian Island chain. The wind howls through the icy peaks of the Aleutian Islands, a chain stretching westward from the Alaskan mainland. The Northern Task Force, a formidable fleet of ships and aircraft, begins its operation. The goal? Take control of these remote islands. But there's more to this mission than meets the eye. This isn't just about gaining territory. It's a strategic gambit, a diversion designed to pull the United States naval forces away from other key locations. Imagine it like a game of chess, where each move can tip the scales of victory. The Aleutian Islands become a pawn, a piece used to distract and disrupt. The task force moves in, their progress marked by the roar of engines and the chop of waves against hulls. The Aleutian diversion was in motion, a chess move in a grand game of war. June 4, 4.30 a.m., the bombing of Midway Island begins. A day of intense battle is on the horizon. Aircraft from Vice Admiral Nagumo's first carrier strike force swoop down on Midway. American fighter aircraft, though heavily outnumbered, mount a fierce resistance, forcing the Japanese Navy to launch a second attack. As the dawn light breaks through the early morning haze at precisely 7.28 a.m., a Japanese reconnaissance plane spots 10 unidentifiable United States Navy surface ships lurking 200 miles northeast of the Japanese Midway invasion force. The tides of the battle are shifting. Minutes later, at 7.52 a.m., the USS Enterprise and USS Hornet launch their dive bombers and torpedo planes. The American counterattack has begun. The surprised Nagumo receives his first report of American carriers in the area at 8.20 a.m., adding a new layer of complexity to the unfolding battlefield. The aircraft of the second Japanese strike force return to their respective carriers for rearming and refueling at 8.37 a.m. As the clock strikes 9, the USS Yorktown takes her turn, launching her aircraft with Nagumo's carrier force as the prime target. Between 9.30 and 10 o'clock, torpedo planes from the USS Enterprise and the USS Hornet begin their daring assaults on the Japanese carriers. Nagumo, realizing the formidable American presence, changes the course of his carrier strike force at 9.18 a.m. The first wave of United States Navy carrier dive bombers, however, faces difficulty in locating their Japanese targets. The Devastator attackers fall one by one, shot down by Japanese Zero fighters in a swift six-minute span. The initial American assault on the Japanese carrier strike force concludes by 10 a.m. Then, at 10.25 a.m., a, a follow-up strike made up of 37 dauntless dive bombers finds the Japanese carriers, now stocked with armed and fueled aircraft on their decks. The three Japanese carriers, Kaga, Soryu, and Akagi, are struck with bombs and ultimately sunk. As midday tolls, the Imperial Japanese Navy bombers strike back against the attacking USS Yorktown. By 2.30 p.m., the USS Yorktown is severely damaged, but refuses to sink. An hour later, her crew abandons their carrier. 
the wounded vessel is towed by United States Navy ships. As the sun starts to set at 5 p.m., the Imperial Japanese aircraft carrier Hiryu is set ablaze after being struck by no fewer than five direct bomb hits from aircraft of the USS Enterprise. As the smoke cleared, the toll of the day was evident. Three Japanese carriers sunk, the USS Yorktown severely damaged. The Battle of Midway marked a turning point in the Pacific War. Picture this. It's June 5th, 1942. The Allies have their eyes set on driving the German pocket back from Sidi Mufta. The Allies, full of determination and vigor, launched an offensive. Their plan? To drive the German forces away from the strategic location of Sidi Mufta. But as we know, even the best laid plans can go awry. The offensive, unfortunately, didn't go as hoped. Despite their best efforts, the Allies couldn't break through the German defenses. The failure was not just a tactical setback, but a costly one. The Allies lost 230 of their tanks in the attack. It was a devastating blow, a stark reminder of the unforgiving nature of war. Meanwhile, thousands of miles away, another drama was unfolding in the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean. The Japanese carrier Hiryu, a symbol of Japanese naval power, found itself in a precarious situation. The Hiryu had been critically damaged in the Battle of Midway, one of the most decisive battles in the Pacific theater. The damage was so severe that the decision was made to scuttle the ship. Scuttling a ship is a last resort, a decision taken when the risk of the enemy capturing the vessel is too high. The crew of the Hiryu, with heavy hearts, prepared for the inevitable. The explosive charges were set, the crew evacuated, and the once mighty Hiryu was left to sink into the depths of the Pacific. The events of June 5, 1942 serve as a stark reminder of the high stakes and dramatic turns of World War II. On one side of the world an offensive failed, costing the Allies dearly. On the other a symbol of Japanese naval power was lost forever. The Allies were dealt a heavy blow and far away, the Hiryu was sinking into the depths of the Pacific. As dawn broke on June 6, the German Luftwaffe had one target, Sevastopol. The city, a strategic stronghold on the Black Sea was under siege. The Luftwaffe, with their infamous Stuka dive bombers, rained destruction from the skies. The city was showered with bombs, the thunderous explosions echoing through the streets, leaving behind only rubble and ruin. Simultaneously on the Western Front, the German assault was relentless. The British 150th Brigade, valiant though they were, could not withstand the onslaught. Outnumbered and outgunned, they fell, their resistance crumbling under the German might. 4,000 British soldiers found themselves prisoners of war, a grim testament to the ferocity of the conflict. As the sun began to set, the theater of war shifted thousands of miles away to the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean. The USS Yorktown, a proud symbol of American naval power, was now a wounded beast. Severely damaged from previous encounters, she was in tow of US Navy forces, limping away from the battlefield. But the Japanese were relentless, a submarine targeted the Yorktown, its torpedoes finding their mark, and the great ship sank beneath the waves. Meanwhile, further north, the Japanese forces were on the move as well. The island of Kiska, part of the Aleutian Islands in Alaska, fell into their hands. A remote outpost, perhaps, but every inch of land was a valuable asset in this vast global conflict. And so, June 6, 1942, a day that began with the bombardment of Sevastopol, ended with the British in chains, the Yorktown at the bottom of the sea, and Kiska in Japanese hands. The toll of war was heavy, the losses severe, but the struggle was far from over. For in the days to come, the world would witness even greater battles, as the forces of the Axis and the Allies clashed across the globe. The day ended with the British in chains, the Yorktown at the bottom of the sea, and Kiska in Japanese hands. The echo of this day's events would reverberate through the annals of history, a grim reminder of the cost of war. June 7th brought an eerie silence as German artillery guns ceased fire on Sevastopol. After five days of constant bombardment, the deafening sounds of war were replaced by a disquieting calm. This was not the end but rather the quiet before the storm. As the clock struck half past two in the morning, the German 11th Army began their assault on Sevastopol from the north. The ceasefire was a strategic move, designed to lull the Soviets into a false sense of relief before the ground invasion. Meanwhile, thousands of miles away, the island of Attu was experiencing a different kind of invasion. Japanese forces took control of the island, extending their reach further into the Pacific. 
The balance of power was shifting and the world held its breath, waiting to see what would happen next. As the German boots marched north, the Japanese flag rose over Atu. By June 10th and 11th, the pressure was mounting. The first free French brigade stationed at Birhaheim could bear no more. They were forced to retreat under the relentless German onslaught. Their retreat was not a sign of weakness, but a strategic move to preserve their forces in the face of overwhelming odds. Meanwhile, the Germans had found allies in the Romanian Mountain Corps and 30th Army Corps. Together, they launched a determined assault on the city of Sevastopol. The goal was clear, to break the Soviet defenses and take control of the city. At the same time, near the sandy dunes of Sidi Mufta, the German army managed to break out of their encirclement. Their breakout wasn't just a flight from entrapment, it was a tactical maneuver aimed at the British 7th Armored Division near El Adem. The Allies retreated, the Germans advanced, and the battlefield was in chaos. From June 12th to 16th, Sevastopol was under siege. The German offensive, a force to be reckoned with, found itself blunted by the unexpected resilience of approximately 180,000 Russian soldiers. These brave men, despite being holed up in the beleaguered city, stood their ground, repelling the relentless German assault. Their resistance was a testament to their indomitable spirit, a beacon of hope amid the desolation of war. However, the Germans were not easily deterred. Led by the formidable Field Marshal Erich von Manstein, a fresh assault was launched on the city. Manstein, a master of strategic warfare, sought to exploit the city's vulnerabilities and break the Russian resistance. But what he encountered was a wall of defiance. The Russian soldiers, battered yet unbroken, continued to hold their position, turning the tide of the battle. The city of Sevastopol, under their steadfast protection, became an unwavering fortress. In the face of the onslaught, the Russian soldiers held their ground, turning Sevastopol into an unwavering fortress. On a hot summer day, June 18, 1942, the city of Tobruk, a stronghold defended by the brave 2nd South African Division, found itself completely encircled by German forces. Tobruk, a strategic gem on the North African coast, was a vital point of contention during the Second World War. Its deep water port and proximity to key supply routes made it a prize worth fighting for. The defenders, the gallant 2nd South African Division, were entrusted with the responsibility of holding this vital lifeline. Just two days later, on the 20th of June, the looming threat turned into a harsh reality. The Desert Fox, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, known for his tactical brilliance, launched an all-out offensive against the city. The skies darkened as artillery shells and Luftwaffe bombs rained down on Tobruk, a storm of steel and fire. The relentless assault was fierce, the German forces pressing their advantage, pushing the defenders to their limits. As the day wore on, the German 15th and 21st Panzer Divisions, armored spearheads of Rommel's Africa Corps, breached Tobruk's outer defenses. By seven in the evening, they had made their way into the city. The brave defenders found themselves fighting a desperate battle in the streets they had sworn to protect. The following day, the situation had turned dire. Despite their valiant efforts, the 2nd South African Division was overwhelmed. Allied General Klopper, a man burdened with the safety of his men and the defense of Tobruk, faced a heart-wrenching decision. By June 21st, the 2nd South African Division, under the command of Allied General Klopper, had no choice but to officially concede defeat and hand control of Tobruk to the Germans. A chapter of courage and resilience closed, marking a significant shift in the North African campaign of World War II. As the dust settled in Tobruk, the Soviet army found itself encircled and defeated at Kharkov on June 27. This was a strategic blow to the Soviets, as the German forces managed to capture an astounding quarter of a million Soviet prisoners. This marked a significant point in the conflict as the balance of power seemingly tipped in favor of the Germans. At the same time, German forces completed their capture of Izum, a city of strategic importance due to its location on the Donetsk River. This victory further solidified the German hold on the Eastern Front, adding to the momentum they had gained with the fall of Kharkov. As the Soviets grappled with these setbacks, the Romanian and German army forces had their sights set on the Crimean Peninsula. They captured essential hilltop positions near Sevastopol, a significant naval base that was the home port of the Soviet Black Sea Fleet. This marked yet another victory for the Axis powers, and with it, they were inching closer to gaining control over the entire region. While these battles raged on the Eastern Front, 
Another significant event was unfolding in the cold waters of the North Atlantic. A British convoy, known as PQ-17, set sail from Reykjavik, Iceland. This convoy was tasked with delivering vital supplies to the Soviet Union, an ally in desperate need of resources. Little did they know, they were about to embark on a journey fraught with danger. The convoy, consisting of 36 ships, would face a relentless attack from German U-boats and surface ships. This onslaught would see the loss of 34 of those 36 ships between June 27 and July 28. A devastating blow to the Allied efforts and a testament to the ferocity of the conflict at sea. Meanwhile, convoy PQ-17, which set sail from Reykjavik, Iceland, was about to face a perilous journey, losing 34 of its 36 ships to German U-boats and surface ships between June 27 and July 28. By June 28, the German army had turned its attention towards the Volga. The vast waterway snaking through the heart of Russia was now in the crosshairs of the German 2nd Army and the 4th Panzer Army. Their objective? Voronezh, a city near the pivotal Kursk, a gateway to the Volga and a stronghold for the Soviets. The German forces, like a well-oiled machine, launched their attacks with a frightening efficiency. The thunderous roars of their Panzer tanks echoed across the plains, their artillery fire lighting up the sky casting long shadows of dread over the Russian landscape. The German machine was unstoppable, or so it seemed, as they pressed on towards Voronezh. Meanwhile, on the Crimean front, the Germans were making headway too. Sevastopol, a city that stood like a defiant fortress on the Black Sea, was now within their reach. The city, once teeming with Soviet soldiers, bristling with guns and fortifications, was on the verge of falling. Over 90% of the Soviet defensive fortifications had crumbled under the relentless German assault. The Germans, having tasted victory at Kharkov and Tobruk, were emboldened. Their strategy, their firepower, their unyielding march seemed to be paying off. The Soviet resistance, though fierce and resolute, was being worn down. The tide of the war was seemingly turning in favor of the Germans. But the Russian spirit was not to be underestimated. The Soviet soldiers, though battered and bruised, held on. They knew the price of failure, the fall of their motherland to the German onslaught. The stakes were high, the pressure immense, but their resolve stronger. As the dust settled and the echoes of the artillery fire faded, a grim picture emerged. The German forces had made significant inroads into Soviet territory, their war machine seemingly unstoppable. But the Soviets were not ready to give up, not yet. They were preparing for the next big fight, the battle that would determine the fate of their homeland. As the German forces continued their relentless advance, a new battle was brewing at Belgorod. The stage was set for another showdown, another test of wills in this brutal war that was World War II. On the last day of June, German General Paulus launched an attack at Belgorod. It's a day etched in the annals of history, a day that saw an audacious German assault aimed at breaking the Russian spirit. But amidst the chaos and destruction, a glimmer of hope emerged. In the beleaguered city of Sevastopol, Russian soldiers were facing an imminent threat. The city was on the brink of falling into German hands, and the situation was dire. Yet, in these darkest hours, the Soviet Black Sea Fleet, under the strategic command of Vice Admiral F.S. Oktyabrsky, orchestrated a daring evacuation. One by one, ships braved the perilous journey, rescuing soldiers from the besieged city. Their destination, safety, their mission, survival. Every man rescued was a small victory, a testament to the indomitable spirit of the Russian forces. With the last of the Russian soldiers evacuated, the month of June 1942 came to a close, a month that had seen the tides of war shift dramatically. 